Hello everyone, and welcome back to the eHoudini Academy Foundation module. In this video, we are going to continue on building out the instancing system where we left off last time, because I had to split the video. So without any further ado, let's continue with that. Okay, so next let's create the controls that we need to determine how many vents we actually keep. Because right now we have all our potential vents being spawned, at least in our little dummy setup. And um, what I want to do is filter out for each of these small and large vents, how many we want to keep, and then have a control for the ratio. So we can determine if we want more small vents or more large vents. And then finally, I want to have a random seed value so I can randomize which points are actually deleted uh, when it reduces the amount of points. So let's go over to the type properties and let's start setting up some new parameters in here. The first parameter that I want to set is for the um, vent count. So let's create a integer parameter for that right here. And by default, um, I'm going to set this to a range from 0 to 25. We could set it higher, but I'm going to lock it at 0. And then under channels, I'm going to set the default value to 15. Okay. Then next, let's add a float value. This one is going to be called the vent ratio but its label is going to be a bit more descriptive. I'm going to call this one vent large slash small ratio. So basically, um, this is going to be a range locked between 0 and 1. And if the ratio is 0, it's going to spawn only large vents. And if it's 1, it's going to spawn only small vents. And then anything in between will be, well, a ratio, right, between those two. Um, now for its default value, I want it to spawn more small vents than large vents, right? So I'm going to set this to 0 0.75. And then finally, let's also add a seed value so we can control the uh, deletion process a bit more. Let's grab this integer here, plug it in, and I'll just call this one vent seed. Now, seed values in general work best when you lock them above zero, because if you ever want to multiply, um, you can't really multiply by zero. You would just get zero all the time. So I'm going to set this to one. And as for its maximum range, I'm going to reach this to 100. As default value, I'll set to one as well. OK, so with that, let's apply this. And let's close it. And then next, um, let's start with our small vents. Uh, over here, let's grab from our vent grid. And we have quite a nice amount of them. Let's grab this and let's create an extract all points node. And with that, we basically remove all of our primitives, but keep all of our points. Okay. And then let's create a delete node. Now I'm going to call this delete node the isolate uh, number of vents for the small vents, so S. Let's set this one up. So up here under operation, I'm going to switch this to delete non-selected. Then I'm going to change entity to points. And down below, let's switch the operation type from pattern to range. And this will basically, by default, uh, delete every other point for the entire range, right? So the range starts at zero, ends on the maximum amount of points, this variable here, and then every other point is deleted. I don't want that. I actually want to keep every single point in my selection. So I'm going to set this from one to one. And then for start and end, I'm going to tell it that I want to keep a certain amount of vents, that being my vent count. Let's copy that. 
paste it in here. And that means I can now control how many vents I have. Let's um, hook up our little dummy viewer. Okay. And then next, I want to control this value here with our ratio as well. So um, if we take this and we multiply it by our ratio, we can control how many of these vents are going to be kept versus our large vents. We'll set up in a minute. So let's grab this, copy that, and then multiply our vent count by our ratio. So now as I reduce my ratio, it's going to remove our small vents. Now you'll notice that it will always keep one point around, and that's simply the default behavior of delete by range. In this case, it won't remove the last point, and we do need to deal with this in a minute. But for now, this will work, so let's move on. Uh, let's set this back. And then I want to be able to control which points are actually deleted randomly. Okay, so let's create a sort node, because what I want to do is simply change around the point numbers. So the first 15 points in this case, or 13 points, um, are going to be randomly assigned. And so it will keep a random set of these vents. Let's call this one randomize vent positions. And then under the point sort, I'm going to switch it over to random, grab my vent seat value, copy that, and then plug it in. And with that, if I view this, we can now control randomly where our vents are going to be kept. Okay, so that's the first part done. Now, like I mentioned, if we actually set our ratio down to too low a value, it will always keep one point. And I do want to get rid of this point if this goes below about one third of my ratio range here. So let's grab another delete node. And I'm just going to set this up. Let's call this one um, remove one point if good ratio. Just gonna stretch this all out a little bit because I'm running out of space here. Now at this point, these nodes are all the same, and it might get a little troublesome to see what each one's doing. So um, what I'm going to do is grab this node here, go up top, open up the shape palette, which you can do in the Z key, by the way. And then down below, I'm just going to set this one to be a diamond shape. And the bottom node here, I'll make an arrow pointing down. Now you can choose whatever shapes you want. I personally don't use shapes too much. I only use them in specific situations like this. Um, but it can be useful. So just make sure it's readable at the end. That's the most important part. Okay, so then under this new delete node here, um, let's set this up so it deletes one point right point zero up here let's switch this to points and then under pattern i'm going to set this to zero so this will remove one point but i want to be able to control when it does this so inside of the enable button here i'm going to write a little expression to turn it on or off depending on our ratio value let's open this up right click and go to the edit expression button so in here, let's write a little expression. Let's type if the um, channel reference for the vent ratio and if you don't get it, you can always type it partially and then it should be there. If this is greater than 0 0.66, so basically if it's on the upper part of our ratio slider. I'm going to set this value to zero, meaning it won't delete the point. So it will keep it at all times. And otherwise, I'm going to remove it. So I'm going to set this to one. 
Let's apply that. And now, depending on the state of my slider, it's going to either keep or remove that last point. Now, you won't really notice the difference very much because we are already removing points or adding points as we change our ratio. But this just means that if we set the slider to anything over, say, two thirds, then it's going to keep all of the points. It's not going to remove any of them. And on the other hand, if we set our slider to zero, which would mean that we only want large vents, we won't have that single point lying around, right? That's what this one's for, because without it, we would still have that one point over there, and I don't want that. Okay, next, let's go ahead and copy this network, and let's paste it here on the left for our large vents as well. Copy that over. Let's plug in our visualizer. And let's switch this around. So instead we keep our large vents, right? So here for our randomize, I'm gonna just add an extra value. So we change the random seed. This will um, mean that our large vents and our small vents are going to operate on different number bases. Our seed value cannot be lower than one. So we shouldn't have to worry about it multiplying by zero. That will be fine. And then, um, under here, let's switch this around. So before our vent ratio was going from zero to one. In this case, we want to invert that range and we can do this really quickly by going into our expression. And I'll just open this up in the expression editor for a moment. And we can say within brackets here, one minus the vent ratio. And basically what this will do is it will take a value of one and then subtract our zero to one range from it. So we're basically inverting our zero to one range to one to zero, simple enough. If we accept that, then now this node instead is going to add vents instead of remove them if we change our ratio around. Now, once again, we do need to make sure that we remove that last point here. So let's also change this expression. In here, I'm gonna say, if the vent ratio is lower than 0 0.33, like that. Okay, so that now removes this last point. Okay, so with that, we now have a basic system here set up. Let's merge these points together. So we now have both of them. Let's grab a good ratio here so we can see both. Merge them in. And if you want to show this with the visualizers, go ahead. Um, just going to grab it on a merge node. And now you can see both of them at the same time. Now at this point, these two vents are not actually accounting for one another just yet, right? If I change my vent count, they will start intersecting with one another. Now, because the large vents are going to be my primary object, I will start removing small vents if they get too close to the large ones. So let's deal with that next. So let's add another delete by distance node right below here. Plug that in. And I want to delete any vent that, like I mentioned before, gets too close to any other vent. So we can just use a simple um, point to point removal method here. Let's plug it in. So it grabs our vents from down below here from our isolate number of vents large when we have the total amount of vents for the large vents here. Grab that plug it in and then we need to set up the distance by which we need to actually delete these points. Um, let's visualize this so we can see better. Now the distance that we need to remove these points by is going to be equivalent to the size of these large vents. So up here under the vent spacing, 
Let's copy the vent size L from over here. And let's just paste that in. And this should now ensure that we have uh, clean points. So if we combine both of these, they should now stay away from one another. And with this preview, let's have a quick look and test it out. So at this moment, we should have our vents staying away from one another properly. Let's template our elevator and staircase shaft and then shift template our building profile as well. So we can see both. And then I'm just going to change my vent spacing a bit. So this needs to be big enough. Let's give it a value of one. Let's um, go ahead and change our ratio. So if we set it to maximum, then we only have small vents. And as we lower it, we will only have large vents. Okay, so that works. Um, now, next to that, if I change my vent seed, it's gonna randomly select which one it wants to grab based on where they can actually exist. That's good. And then finally, we can control the total vent count. Now I do want to double check and make sure that we will never have too many vents. This seems to be working at the moment, but I do want to add a little extra layer of control over that just in case. And besides that, there is a uh, one other thing that we need to tweak here. And that has to do with, if I set my vent ratio to the maximum value, in this case down here, we still have one point remaining, which means that this delete by distance node is going to still remove any points that exist in that space. And if we only have small vents because our ratio is one, I don't want this. So let's add a switch in here that very simply disables our large vent points if we only have small vents. I'll just call this one disable if ratio is one. Keep it very simple. Um, plug it in like so, and then let's grab our ratio value. And then up here, let's just type an if statement. If the ratio value is equal to one, then zero, so basically disabled, otherwise one. So now in case our ratio value is one, uh, we won't be removing those points over there. And lastly, before we move on to the next section of the video, um, I just want to deal with the excess amount of points that we can potentially get because of our um, range based deletion. Basically, what it does is it keeps all the points between zero and nine, and then we were removing one. But if this one is disabled, then it won't remove that point, which means we actually have 10 points. And I do want it to be accurate. I want this to match my vent count. So I'm just going to clean this up in post. So let's just add an extra delete node right here. Let's pull this down a bit. Plug this in. And in this case, I'm going to delete my points based on an expression. Let's go over here to delete by expression. And then under its expression field, I'm going to specify the current point number using the local variable dollar sign PT for the current point number. And then in here, I'm going to say if this is greater or equal than my current vent count. So basically, if it is point number nine or higher, I'm going to remove it. Now, um, this is an expression field, but it's an expression field for a uh, number value. So we can just evaluate this. That should work. And now you can see that it is actually removing that last point. Now, just because I want my randomization to be proper as well, um, let's add one of these random nodes in front of it. So 
So as I change my seed value, we are definitely going to have a random distribution of everything. But okay, so um, let's give this one a name. Let's call this one delete access points. And then we have our spawn points ready. The only thing we still have to do for this part is raise them up to the roof of the building. So um, for that, we can simply grab the bounding box of our copy floors node again. Let's create a transform node. Call this one raise to roof. And then I'm going to type a bounding box expression in here. Reference the copy floors node. In this case, that should be copy floors one. And then say dy max. This will raise them up to the top of our roof. If you want to double check, just follow your reference line. There we go. Okay, so this will deal with the basic positioning of our points. And that means that now we can actually use these points to place our instances next. Now, um, in order to make this work, I'm going to create a little hard-coded database with two sets of points, one for the large vents and one for the small vents. And then I'm gonna copy those onto our points over here. And that will basically just copy their information along. So to do that, um, let's go over here and let's add a new netbox. Now call this one assign objects from database. Now in this case, our database is going to be hard coded because I only have two objects to spawn. Uh, like I mentioned, you can actually set up a dedicated database that loads from an external file or something. Uh, in this case, I'm not gonna bother. Uh, we don't need it. But I am going to create a little setup here that we can easily update and add to later, or you personally can do that if you want to. Let's create an add node. And this will create a simple point in the middle of our grid, right? And then from there, um, I want to create a attribute wrangle node. And I'm going to call this wrangle node instance data HVAC large. Plug that in. Now the attributes that we need to create are just like before. We need to have a normal up and p scale, though the p scale and the up vector are optional. It is useful to have them. So I'm going to copy these, paste them inside of this vec script, like so. And that will give us a basic normal pointing in the X positive direction and then the next attribute that we need is the unreal instance attribute and this is basically going to determine what object this point is going to grab in unreal and we can get that really easily if we go into unreal we go to the content browser to where our mesh is located in this case that would be our prefabs folder and then under here, you can grab either one. In this case, I'm gonna start with the large vent. Right click it, and then copy its reference. And this will give you the reference address to this particular um, file under this particular path here in Unreal. Let's go back to Houdini. And I'm gonna set up a little um, link here so we can write out an attribute using a string parameter. Let's say s at unreal instance, which is the attribute that unreal expects, the Houdini engine expects to know what instance to grab in unreal. 
and then I'm going to say um, CHS or channel reference string unreal path. Now this is a parameter name so this can be anything but the moment I promote this up it's going to create a new string parameter right here and we can just go ahead and paste in the um, value that we got from Unreal, right? The um, mesh reference. This one. So this will give us a basic path that this node will now be able to use. And in fact, at this point, we have all the information that we'll need to instance this particular object. If I were to provide this point to the output of my node, it would work, okay? So now, if we look over here in our uh, spreadsheet, we can see that we have a point position, a normal, a P scale, the up vector, and then here, a string value for the Unreal Instance attribute, which is a bit too big to really see in its entirety, but it does work. Now I'm gonna set this up a little bit more um, robust so we can specify exactly where our meshes folder is in Unreal. Um, but for now, let's just quickly grab this and create one for our small objects and then copy them on so we can actually test it out in Unreal first. Let's grab this uh, instance data HVAC node. I'm going to make this blue and I'm going to copy it over for our small ones. Then uh, in here, let's change the name. Let's go over to Unreal, copy this reference, and then I'm gonna replace that one. So now we have this, but we don't actually have a way to copy it onto our points, not yet anyway. So what I would like to do is add an additional attribute to both of these that allows us to identify them. So we can use the same trick that we used um, over here for our visualizer, when we use the uh, icon attribute, basically the um, piece attribute that a copy to points node uses to determine what object it should copy on what point. Now, in order to make this work, we do need to add a piece attribute to both of our different set of spawn points and to these two here. So let's start with our uh, instance data. I'm gonna create a new um, string value called object name. And I'm gonna again link it to a channel string value. I'm just gonna move all of this over. And this one I will call the um, HVAC large. Then let's copy this name value here, copy it over, and let's paste it here on the right as well. And I'm going to call this one HVAC small. So there we go HVAC small and HVAC large. Then up here in the network, let's create some um, attribute creates. Let's create one here. Let's call it attribute create HVAC large. Plug that in. And we need to specify the object name, right? Just like below. object name and then for its value it's going to be a point string set to HVAC large okay now let's copy that paste it into the right and let's change its name okay so now we should have all of our points here, assigning either HVAC large or HVAC small, depending on their distribution. So I'm just gonna check this out.
here we have our spawn points let's grab our parameters we have a nice mix there we go so now you can see hvac large hvac small they're kind of intermixed which is good then let's grab a copy to points node and i'm going to merge these two together so this is our little database of different objects that we can try to spawn and then i'm going to take my points here so these ones i'm going to copy those as the main object to copy and the target points to copy to is going to be our spawn points so like this then right now it's just copying all of them double so inside of our piece attribute let's switch this to object name and now it should properly copy all of our points now at this point they all have the same orientation because they're simply copying the orientation of the source point and they're being copied in one direction only but okay so with this we now have our points um, we still need to give them a proper rotation and we still need to set up the final instancing output but it should already be working so what I want to do is just create a new output of our system and just test it out in a real real quick before we continue with the last part let's create a null node here now call this one out instances And then let's go up to the top of our network. And here I'm going to create a new geometry container specifically for our instances. I don't mind where you put it, just uh, you know, put it somewhere. I'm going to call this one instances. And then in here, let's create an object merge. Let's go into the building asset. Look for our out instances node. Grab that. Okay. Um, we're going to call this one in instances. And then let's create an output node as well for this node. Okay, so with this, we now should have all the information that we need to make this work in Unreal. Um, let's just double check. We have all of our attributes. Yes. And let's save this out. Let's go to the final node in our network. Render that. Save the tool. And let's go over to Unreal here. So we have our tool right there. Let's go to HDA, find our um, foundation building tool, re import, rebuild. And now here we go. We have some of our HVAC units spawning on the roof. So that's nice. Um, I'm just going to make this building slightly bigger. So we have more space for them. Grab this. And that seems to be working. So um, yeah, I'm gonna turn off my visualizer for a moment. We'll actually build a separate toggle for the grid on top of the roof. So we can turn it off independently from the rest of the visualizer. Um, but yeah, here, so we now have our instances and it appears that at this point they are spacing properly if i go to my props i can change this around maybe change my ratio all right cool that all works then uh, the amount let's change that let's say uh 20 5 1 
Okay. And as for the spacing, let's lower this all the way down. And now they're practically on top of one another, but at least that works too. <laughs> let's keep that at a reasonable value. But okay, let's get back to Houdini. And we need to build two more remaining systems. The first one involves a wrangle script, which is going to take a random value and turn it into an angle for our points. So we can have a vectors pointing in any one of the four different cardinal directions here. And the second part is going to deal with splitting our instances for Unreal so we can output them as individual static meshes instead of an instance-based cluster of objects. So um, let's create that wrangle node first. And I'm going to just plug it in here and call it the um, set point normal. And inside this VEX script, we are going to have to write two different components. First, we should provide a up vector and a P scale. Then we have to set up a random rotation value, which is going to be an angle. So it's going to be 0, 90, 180, or 270. And then finally, we're going to turn that into a normal value using a um, basic trigonometry function. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to scare you half to death with trigonometry here. I am just going to explain it quickly, and then we're just going to do it, and you'll see how it works. So first, like I said, let's create a vector up attribute. Like so. And then next, let's also provide a P scale. So that's the one. Because we are ultimately giving these points to a copy the points node. And I do want to make sure I provide a P scale of one. You don't have to do this per se, especially because we are copying points onto points. They don't really need a scale. But still, I like to keep it clean. So that's what we're going to do. And then next we need to create a random rotation. Okay, so in here, um, we need to write a little script that's going to grab a random rotation value um, between 0, 90, 180, and 270, right? So let's go over to um, my drawing board here, and I have a little explanation prepared for you. Let's go over to this page. And the function that we are going to use is called RAND. And this stands for random, obviously. Um, basically, what this is going to do is it's going to return to us a value between 0 and 1 based on whatever value we originally put inside of it. And then what we can do with that is take a round to integer expression and round that value um, between 0 and 1. And that will return, in this case, either a 0 or a 1 at a 50% each chance. Okay, so whatever value we put in here, by default, this function is going to give us 50-50 on 0 or 1 if we round it. Now, in this case, what we can do with that is take this value of 0 or 1 and we can multiply that by 90 which of course will give us 90 degrees, right? It's gonna give us zero or 90 degrees. So technically this could already work if we wanted to rotate our objects um, either in one orientation or another, but it will be fixed in those two directions. Now in our situation, we actually want to multiply it to create four numbers, right? We want to create zero, 90, 180, and 270. So we'll need a range from zero to three. And we can do that if we take our equation and change it around just a little bit. Let's take our round to integer equation with its random value from 0 to 1 and multiply that by 4. And what that will do is we'll take our 0 to 1 range and it will stretch it from 0 to 4. Then if we take our round to integer function, it will snap each of the values inside this range to their nearest integer. And that will return this. So everything before 0 0.5 is going to snap to 0. Then here it's going to snap to 1. 
between uh, 1.5 and 2.5 is going to be 2 and 4 here is everything above 3.5 so what that basically returns to us is that we have a 12.5 percent chance to get a value of 0 we have a 25 percent chance to get a value of 1 2 or 3 and then a 12.5 percent chance again to get a value of 4. in general this is a bit problematic but since we are basically returning an angle we don't have to worry about it because angles eventually wrap back around right so instead we could say that 0 and 4 are just part of the same direction 0 in this case 0 times 90 is 0 and 4 times 90 is 360 that's the same direction and because of that we don't really have to worry about it because this is 12 and a half percent chance that is 12 and a half percent chance together they form 25 percent chance right simple now in the situation that you actually want to have an evenly distributed set of chances for every one of your numbers um, you can also use a floor expression instead of a round to integer expression and what this one will do instead is it's going to take our entire range and it's going to snap it down to its lowest integer so anything below one is going to snap to zero anything below two is going to snap to one and so forth now the thing about the rand node or random expressions is that they never return a pure zero or one value it's always going to be something right in between i mean i think the chance that it ever reaches zero or one is very 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 small so i don't think you have to ever worry about it and what that means is that if we multiply our random value from 0 to 1 by 4 then our highest possible number is going to be 3.99999 okay and that value will then snap down to a value of 3 and if i look at that then you can see that we have four values 0 1 2 and 3 and each one has a perfect 25 percent chance of occurring right so this is basically the types of expressions we can use and the way how to write those in vex is very simple so let's type this out let's say uh, we first create a local variable for our random number our uh, zero to one range so i'm going to say float random equals the rand function and then in here i will specify my current point number which will drive the rand function's output right but then i want to take a seed value and i want to multiply by that so let's just create a um, spare parameter here so we can uh, play with that and if i go ahead and look at the output of this let me just create a temporary test variable then over here you can see that each point has a random value so as i move this around you can see that all the values besides the first one are changing and that's simply because the first one is being multiplied by zero right point zero multiplied by our seed value is always zero so to fix that i'm just going to add plus one to my point number here and now no matter what they will all get a random value with my slider okay then next let's provide the angle in two different directions let's type uh, float angle 2 equals round to integer of the random value and that will basically give us what i described before right the um basic uh, values here and then we're going to multiply that by 90. so if i go ahead and run this through my test then we are simply going to get a value of 0 and 90. okay but like i said i want to have four directions so let's take this value and let's multiply it by four 
And this will immediately give us what I discussed before. Basically, we're going to get this equation where 0 and 4 equate to the same as 1, 2, and 3. Now, if you want to use the other method I described with the floor function, then we can basically just replace rint here, round the integer, with floor, and that will return values between 0 and 270. But okay, so with that, we have an angle value. Um, let's go ahead and set this up so we can return this as a normal instead. And for this, we need to actually create a um, trigonometry function. So let's call this one um, get normal using trig. And then let's type v at n dot x and v at n dot c. Now, um, these are the two values that we need to set for our normals, because in the end, that's what a normal actually is. It's a value between negative 1 and 1, if it's normalized anyway, um, in both the x, y, and z direction. Now, we don't care about the y direction in this case, so it's basically a two-dimensional normal that we need to set. And to do that, we can use these sinus and cosinus vex functions. Um, now, I will quickly show you what this means in terms of trigonometry. Um, but let's first type out these functions and then I'll show you what it does. So let's type out sine. And then inside of this sine function, I'm going to add a radiance function. And these together basically allow us to retrieve from an angle the um, normal value for the x direction. So let's grab our angle value here. Let's plug that in. And this will, well, assuming that we don't have an error, already give us a x value in either positive or negative x, right? And then let's copy this. And let's replace the sine function with the cosine function. And if we do that, and we confirm that, then now you can see that we do have random orientations in four different directions. And if we change our random value, that they do point in different directions altogether. So now we have a proper normal. Now the way how trigonometry works, and again, I'm not gonna go too deep into this, but if you go to Google and you just search for trigonometry GIF, right? Um, and then look for any of these, you can find some nice little animations that show you what it actually does. So you saw how we had to provide for each different orientation a different equation. Well, that's the same here. In this case, the x direction is the sine, and the y direction here, the z direction, is the cosine. And as we provide a different angle, a different rotational angle here, these values change. Uh, here's another GIF, for example, that kind of demonstrates what it does. As our angle goes around in a circle, we provide either a positive or negative value from our cosine and a different value at the same time from our sine for the x direction. Now, in this case, I'm not going to go any deeper than this. I mean, just look at this picture long enough and eventually you will just start to understand it. Um, that's the nice part about these GIFs that you can find online. If you don't understand a math problem, oftentimes you can find it somewhere. Um, but anyway, let's go ahead and hook this up. So I'm going to take the set point normal node and I'm just going to hook its random seed over here into our interface. So we grab our uh, vent seed over here, copy that parameter paste that in. So now we have a random orientation with our random point position, right? Now let's go ahead and test this out in Unreal quickly, and then we'll um, deal with the last part. Um, let's go ahead and save this. Reload our tool. And now the vents should start pointing in different directions. Yes, here we go. 
So if I change my seed value, as you can see they change positions and they change orientations, which is what we want, of course. And then finally, um, let's deal with that last component because I want to be able to turn these into their own separate meshes as well, uh, based on a setting. Um, so let's go to Houdini and let's deal with that. So over here, let's grab our out instances node, drag this down, and I'm going to wrap this inside of a new um, netbox. And let's call this one instances out or instances output. Then I'm just going to create a null node here so I can see what I'm doing. And then next, let's create a switch node and also a null node. And I'm going to call this null the no instances null. And as for the switch, uh, let's call this the instance display mode. So I'm going to plug this in, first the null, then our main line, like so. And then finally, um, let's add two attribute create nodes right here. So in order to split our instances up, we need to provide a instance ID for every single mesh that we want to split into its own separate component. Now, if we want to split every single one of these meshes here into their own component, then they all need to have their own unique ID. And we can do this very easily if we go to the uh, attribute create here, and I'm just going to call this one instance ID. It doesn't really matter what the name is, but I'm going to name it like that. It's going to be an integer. And under its value, I'm going to provide the Houdini local variable for the point number. So dollar sign PT, right? If you do that, then now we should have an instance ID attribute here, each one for its own point. And then next, let's go ahead and create the second attribute create node right here. And this one I will call the um, Unreal Split Instances. And as for its attribute itself, what we need to provide to Unreal is called Unreal Split Attr or ATTR. And this will look for a string value with the name of the instance ID that has the unique value for each one of the instances. So uh, let's set this to a string. And I'm going to type here inst ID. So basically, all this really does, if we look at it if, over here in the spreadsheet, is tell it to look for the instance ID attribute. And then from there, it will retrieve its value. Okay. So if we hook this up to our interface so we can switch it around, let's uh, grab our type properties. Go down to say our props over here. So let's go ahead and grab our switch variable, plug it into our props grab a separator too, keep it separate. And I'm going to turn this into a ordered menu first. And then as for its name, let's say um, props output mode. Then let's go to the menu option. And let's set this up. So the first one is going to be disabled. So basically, um, if we have it's set to zero. We're not spawning any instances at all. We're not spawning anything. At one, I'm going to set this to 
instances. And this is only going to work in Unreal. So I'm going to add this inside um, brackets here, like so. And then the last value I will set to um, split instances. Again, this will only work in Unreal. So I'm going to add that to that. And with that, um, let's just set our default value to one. So we always start with default instances for Unreal. And then let's click apply. And now, assuming everything is set up properly, let's go over to um, Unreal and test everything out one last time. And then I think we can close off this lecture. So let's save this out. Go to Unreal, reload, rebuild, and now under the props tab, we now have this option here. So we can go and set this to split instances. And assuming you refresh the tool properly, um, you should now be able to select each one of these individual static meshes and just move them around as you want to. If we go back to the tool, click on the asset component, and then switch it back to our instances, then now everything is back to the way it was. So we have our individual instance objects, and if we click on those, you can see that they are clustered together. And this is far more efficient. Um, instance static mesh components like this are better they are more efficient and they don't take as much memory. So I do recommend you use that if you're trying to create tools for Unreal. But of course, there can always be a reason why you might not actually want to use that option. In case you actually need to move your static meshes around afterwards, for example. Now, um, let's quickly test it out. Let's grab our character. We can go ahead and walk between our objects. Our spacing is working, uh, rotations are working. So yeah, at this point we have our basic system completed. We have our basic instancing. And that means that for this lecture, um, we are pretty much done. So in the next video, we are going to deal with the FBX based mesh generation, uh, the one that I showed you earlier. and. It's going to be very similar to how we use the file node here to load our dummy objects but we're going to take it a step further and we're going to be able to assign a couple of materials and collision types so unreal can use those as well so we're basically going to take our meshes and recreate them inside of houdini and output them as a model output and the way how we do this determines how unreal reads this right what type of collision it's going to use if it has a material or not. So we'll deal with that in the next video. And with that, thanks for watching this video. If you want to share your progress, please come over to the EHD Academy Discord channel. We have a nice community there who loves to share their work and to talk about Houdini. And I personally would love to see what you've come up with with the instances, if you've customized them or whatever you've done with it. So if you liked the video, please leave a comment or a like. And other than that, I hope to see you in the next one. Thanks for watching and have a good one.